Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Great to see everybody. Welcome on this warm summer's evening. Uh, nice to see everybody tonight. Welcome to our evening worship service. Welcome to everybody worshiping on Facebook, watching in that way. Welcome to visitors and guests. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have everybody here this evening. I just want to, in addition to welcoming you, let you know about a few announcements uh, that we have, just about church life coming up, and then we'll get started with our worship service in just a minute. Um, one is to uh, invite you to see the friendship pad. It's on the table back there. If you're uh, just mark your attendance with us after you leave and uh, sign that. And if you want to know more about GPC, then we'll be glad to be in touch and tell you more about who we are as a family of faith. And then also, um, thank you to the Congregational Life Committee. who uh, had, We had our big uh, potluck lunch last Sunday after one of the morning worship services, and it was a great deal of fun. So thank you to everybody who helped put that on as well. Um, it's Communion Sunday, and so here at our evening worship service, you may know this uh, if you've been here before, but we do it by method of intention. And so Mike will lead us in a few minutes in communion, and then you'll be invited to come up. Um, just come out of your rows to the center aisle, and you can grab a piece of the bread, and you can dip it into the cup, and uh, then partake of communion in that way, by that method known of intention. Um, and then uh, just to say there's a little bit of a format change for our evening worship service. It's going to start next week not this week but next week and uh um, susie mike john and i and a few others in the worship team have been working on this a little bit and that is to try to create a, a, an increased sense of intimacy and to respond to uh some people's needs whether they're here at the evening service or in our regular morning services we're going to have communion every sunday night as part of our evening worship service and there's a lot of churches that do that and uh, again, it increases our appreciation for the sacrament and what it means to be uh, Christians who partake in the Lord's Supper on a regular basis. And so we hope there'll be some people uh, who might come for the morning service because they would like to have communion uh, on a regular basis. And we'll have that uh, as part of our evening worship service. And so we're looking forward to that. And then another change is that we're going to have a different uh, sermon in the evening than from the morning. And so we'll have, uh, again, uh, everything in the mornings would be the same with our traditional services. And then in the evenings, um, for the fall, we've planned out a series that has to do with, uh, we're just calling it basic Christian beliefs. And so next week is uh, about revelation, um, about how we know God, because God uh, self-discloses himself to us, and what it means to worship a God who reveals himself to us. And then we're gonna talk about things like uh, the Trinity, uh, creation, um, sin and uh, salvation and all those kind of things. So it's going to be a, a series on basic Christian beliefs. And so if you know of anyone who might be interested in that, you can invite them to that. You can certainly, um, uh, we're going to have, we thank some folks from the morning who has expressed an interest in coming to the evening worship service and accept it's the same sermon as the morning, and it is, and I wouldn't want to sit through one of my sermons twice, so <laughs> I can't imagine, not know where I'm coming from. So um, I'd sit through mine twice, but not mine. Um, and so uh, anyway, it's going to be a different sermon in the evening and the morning. We're going to have communion every evening worship service, and so we're really looking forward to that. And I hope you are too. And uh, you know, we are, we're an evolving work in progress. But we are uh, excited about this service. And then also, one more thing, just to let you know, it's also next Sunday, the 14th of August, is our kickoff Sunday, where we start uh, so many things back, uh, like some, some new morning Sunday school classes, some midweek Bible studies, uh, youth group activities, children's Sunday school has been off for July. So it's kickoff Sunday, next Sunday, and there are lots of special things that are going to be happening and you can see them on our website, you can see them in the bulletins, and just excited about what the program year entails for us as we uh, start our time of worship together. Those are all our announcements, and so let's start our worship service with prayer. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the warmth of the sun, and it warms us. And just as you warm our skin by the light above us, O oh God, you warm our hearts by the light within us. And so we are grateful for this night that we have a chance to worship. We are grateful for you and all of your love. And we lift up this time of worship to you. We pray for your Holy Spirit to be so present with us and that you would guide us and direct us in all that we do and say. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. It's great to see you all this evening. Let's, uh, let's stand and let's worship a little bit.
Jesus Christ be with you. And also, also with you. you. Please greet one another with the sign of Christ's peace. I hope to bring it down much further. It's a new I want to read to you two scripture lessons this evening. One of them is printed in the bulletin. I want to go before that though, to a passage in the Old Testament um, that is from the book of Genesis, and it's Genesis chapter 15. And it's part of the uh, Abraham cycle of stories that start in about Genesis 12 and then move through for uh, a lot of the remainder of Genesis, certainly through uh, um, Genesis 17, where God seals the covenant. With Abraham, um, you have this story in Genesis 15 here in verses 1 through 6 where God comes to Abraham to remind him again of the promise of the covenant. So God says this, uh, Genesis 15, starting in verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram, and God said in a vision, Do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born of my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to Abram again, and God said, This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look towards the heavens and count the stars, if you can. Then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. And then there's another passage. It is from a bulletin. It's going to start with the very same words that God says to Abraham. Jesus is going to say to his disciples, uh, Luke 12, verses 32 through 40. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. 
sell your possessions, give alms, make purses for yourselves that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near, no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So be dressed for action, have your lamps lit, be like those who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet so that they may open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves for whom the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will fasten his belt, have them sit down to eat, and he will come and serve them. If he comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But know this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, then he would not let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I've never been very good at math. Uh, I've always been humanities oriented, never great at maths or sciences. Um, but like a lot of you, I've learned certain formulae, formulas in school um, that you had to learn along the way, whether that's algebra or maybe geometry, you learn these things, or maybe sometimes these formulas are so often talked about in our culture that you just kind of pick up on them and you know these. So I could never even begin to explain to you how Einstein's general the theory of relativity works, but everybody knows that E equals MC squared. You know it, can you explain it? <laughs> maybe you can, some people can, that's good, I can. I remember learning from geometry how to find the, the area, the surface area of a circle, which of course is pi r squared. That's exactly right, pi r squared, the area of a circle. And that inevitably leads to one of my dad's favorite jokes, which is one of the worst dad jokes that's possibly out there. But I can remember my dad when I was taking geometry, and he would come home and say, how do you find the surface area of a square, of a circle? And I would say, Pi r squared. And he'd say, what? Pi r squared? Aren't they teaching you anything at that school? Pi r squared? Pi r round. <laughs> I know, thank you. <laughs> no, really, please. It, it does remind me that there is now, I've seen about the last year, the whole dad jokes sort of memes and area on the internet making fun of those people who are about 52 years old. Um, <laughs> My kids give me dad jokes all the time, of course. Another formula, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And what is that formula known as? Pythagorean theorem. Pythagorean wow. theorem, that's exactly right. You probably know that as soon as the scarecrow receives his diploma from the wizard in the Wizard of Oz, what does he become? He becomes a doctor of thinkology. And as soon as he receives his diploma, the scarecrow says, the sum of square root of any two sides of the sausage triangle is equal to the square root of the remaining side. Joy, rapture. He is overwhelmed and overjoyed that he knows this formula and that it makes sense. So I think there's a formula about faith, about spiritual life that emerges out of scripture in lots of places. And I think it emerges especially out of these two readings that we have before us tonight. I think it's sort of embedded in here, this formula that I made it up, but I think it makes sense, and I think it's in there. F plus C equals SD. F plus C equals SD. And either F or C alone could equal SD, but when you add them together like Jesus does here in Luke 12, then I think it's very, very real. So, what do those mean? SD stands for spiritual death. F stands for fear. C stands for complacency. Fear plus complacency equals spiritual death. So, let's look and dive into these texts, and I'll just explain this out a little bit further. Uh, what were the words that were spoken by God, by Jesus, to Abram, to the disciples? The first words that we hear spoken in both of these readings are... Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Now, this fear is talked about here. It's not the fear of danger. There is a good fear of danger that God has implanted in us that keeps us safe. He's not talking about that kind of fear. I had dinner with some high school friends the other night, and one of them was telling me that 
he and his family went on vacation uh, just a couple of weeks ago to one of those islands, uh, Caribbean islands, one of those where it's part of the old British uh, empire. And so they drive on the wrong side of the road, the left side of the road. And so he said that they were on this mountainous cliff and it was a cliff road driving on the left side of the road with the steering wheel on the right side of the car. And he was just white knuckling it because he was so afraid. That's a good kind of fear that keeps you safe. Not that kind of fear. The fear that we are steered away from in the Bible time after time is a fear that comes upon us due to a lack of trust. Due to a lack of trust. Do not be afraid, says God to Abraham. Trust me and I will deliver. So this reading in Genesis 15, it does come after Abraham has promised, been promised by God that Abraham and Sarah will have a son. God will deliver. God will fulfill his promise. They will have a son. They will become the father and mother of a great nation with more descendants than there is sand on the seashore. Too many to count. Abraham, trust me. Go where I tell you to go and I will fill your heart's desire. So Abraham leaves his ancestral home in Ur. He picks up and travels hundreds of miles, goes, goes west, goes down into Egypt, follows God's lead and goes where God says he should and trusts God for a while, for several years, until as he starts to wonder, as he wanders and he ponders how long it's been since God promised him that he would have a son and how old they are and how unlikely it seems. And he starts to think to himself that maybe I ought to engineer and sort of manufacture for myself how this ought to work. And maybe I should make myself have an heir. So much time has passed. God has forgotten. It's not going to happen. The Lord helps those who help themselves, right? That's a biblical formula, right? No. You'll never find in the Bible the phrase, the Lord helps those who help themselves. You will find it in a lot of Greek writings, Greek mythology, Greek, especially in Greek comedies and Greek tragedies. One written by Euripides in 428 BC, where one of the characters says this, Try first yourself, and then after, call on the gods. He who strives will find that the gods strive equally on his behalf. In other words, with that sort of Greek way of thinking, that Greek comedy, Greek tragedy, try first yourself, and if you fail, then ask for help later. Well, I don't know if you've ever tried that, like I have sometimes, and then your own life turns into a little mini Greek comedy or tragedy, mainly because we say to ourselves, I got this, I got this, I can handle this, I can do it. Some situation comes on us in life and some circumstance come upon us and we have a great decision to make perhaps and we don't pray or we just won't pray. Maybe some kind of opportunity comes to us and maybe it's some kind of deal or something that might benefit us greatly and our pride swells and we don't do any due diligence. And for the Christian, the very basic form, the first form of due diligence is prayer, seeking God's wisdom. We don't do any due diligence. And then, of course, the comedy begins, or maybe even the pain, because we're going against God's will. The first followers of Jesus were a fearful lot. They were afraid, and I think they got more afraid as they spent more time with Jesus. Because they start to understand his teachings penetrate their ears and they see him at work and they start to understand what total trust in him is going to entail and what it will really mean to totally trust Jesus, this kind of radical trust in him that is absolutely life, topsy-turvy, turning and turning our priorities upside down to really trust him and him alone to provide what is necessary for life. To trust Jesus and Jesus alone, first and foremost. This teaching from Luke 12 comes from a larger place, this excerpt does, where Jesus is talking a lot about this. He's talking about priorities, and he is talking about who do you trust, what do you trust in more than anything else. 
And Jesus is asking his disciples to trust him with a depth of trust that is absolutely astounding. Trust me, do not worry, little flock. It's almost as if he is speaking to spiritual children, and he is at this point. They're still spiritual children. They have to go through the rest of his ministry, witness especially the cross, and then also experience the resurrection. And then they'll be coming, they'll come into maturity. But until they come into maturity, Jesus is saying to them, trust me, trust me, trust me. And then when they reach maturity, they will trust him with an incredible power in their hearts and in their minds. The larger context of Luke 12 is about who you trust ultimately. And things back then are pretty much the same as things are now when it comes to how people trust and what people trust in. Back then and now, most people in our world trust in money and possessions and status. What people treasure is the benchmark of trust in their hearts, meaning the more treasure you have, the more you trust in yourself. In other words, the more you, more you would trust, the more you have, the more you would trust in yourself. You'll trust in your resources to be safe, to survive, to weather a storm, some family storm, some health scare. You will make it through, you believe, because of who you are and what you have. Our earthly treasure becomes our security. And where our treasure is, there is our heart also. And so Jesus says, no, no. Your treasure is not to be in anything other than God, not your possessions, not your status, not anything more than God. Proverbs 3 utters these great truths. I love these verses. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and God will make your paths straight. In the parable just before this, Jesus tells his disciples that they can have everything and yet have nothing. That they can have everything. They can have everything so much that they need to build bigger barns in which to store all of their treasure. And yet it won't matter at all at the point of death. If you live your life trusting in anything else more than God, it will eventually lead you to living on this, this continual loop of fear and worry. It's like you'll be strapped into a roller coaster that's just blowing through the boarding station time and time again. And you're just going faster and faster. And you never stop and you're going faster when things slow down a little bit and you can catch your breath, you realize it's only because you're climbing up this hill only to have the bottom drop out again, and on and on and on. Trusting in anything other than God leads to fear, and F equals SD. And then right after fear, he talks about complacency. He talks about what it means to be complacent in our faith. Complacency in your spiritual life equals failure, fail, failing for long enough, equals death. Now, Jesus, of course, talks about three parables about being prepared, being ready, being prepared, watching out for him, being prepared to meet him, being prepared to serve him, serving him as if he will appear at any minute. Be dressed and ready for action. Jesus said, let your lamps be lit. Be ready like good servants who are waiting for the master of the house to come home from a wedding feast. Wedding feasts in those days lasted days. Lasted sometimes up to a couple of weeks. I don't know how long yours lasted. I don't know how long yours lasted. But wedding feasts back in those days could last for a long time, up to a couple of weeks. And so the master of the house might come back in two days. He might come back in ten days. But he's looking for those servants to be ready. Be ready. It might come at noon, it might come at midnight, but be ready. Be as ready to meet Jesus. Be as alert and as prepared as you would be if you had been given a warning that a thief was going to break into your house at a certain time. Don't know about y'all, but in our house we turn an alarm on every night. Every night I go check the four ground floor doors to make sure that they are shut and bolted. We go in and out. The dog comes in and out of all these doors pretty much every day. So I make sure that they are locked and that they are bolted and we turn on the alarm. 
If I were warned that at 3.30 a.m. someone's going to try to break into my house, then I would get my teddy bear and run through the attic and hide. No, no. I would be ready. He would react to every sound. I'd have all the lights on inside and outside. I would try to scare them away, make noise, deter them. Do not be complacent, says Jesus in these parables. Complacency comes to us because of spiritual boredom. Chris Strawn is a Christian clinical psychologist, teaches at Fuller Seminary. He's written a lot about what he calls spiritual ennui, that French concept of being in a state of sort of stuck or listless without any eagerness. Strawn writes, boredom in prayer or spiritual discipline can be a common experience among people of faith. Then questions arise about what's going wrong, and then some people stop their practices altogether. He talks about how we go through seasons of life where sometimes we're able to pray really well and, and energetically, but there's sometimes in our hearts where we just do not feel that devotional moment. And we get lost in our own thoughts, and prayer becomes difficult, and then faith becomes difficult. And then it can be days or weeks because you, when you pray again, Complacency creeps in, spiritual apathy creeps in for all of us. It just does. There is complacency, there's this listlessness that comes upon you, and if you've ever felt a sort of a spiritual ennui, and if that's you in your life right now, with a sort of spiritual listlessness, then you are in the exact right place. Because we have some good medicine for what ails you. Because we're starting our program here Next week, like I just mentioned, we've got all these incredible opportunities to learn and to study and to grow closer and to do something different. And Mike has created this great resource list of books and then also podcasts, all these different ways that you can change your routine and do something different in your faith in order to grow and in order to learn. You've got to change your routine every now and then because if you're in a routine, it just digs a little deeper until that routine becomes a rut and the rut just digs a little deeper and a rut then becomes a grave when you're spiritually dead. Don't let that happen. Don't let fear come in. Don't let complacency come in. Don't let them equal spiritual death in your life. Trust in Jesus Christ. Christ is so ready to turn your ennui into action. He's ready to relieve all of that stress from you. He's ready to, to, to lift the worry from your heart. He's ready to bring you into true security. He invites you to stop the roller coaster that your life may be on. Stop the fear and the complacency because you trust in the Lord with all of your heart and you lean not on your own understanding. Amen. Let us take just a few minutes for reflection. And then we'll start to worship again in just a few minutes. day I was um, doing my morning devotionals and I got it from a teacher of mine and it stumbled on this passage from the book of Isaiah and it's God talking and it's God describing that when God says something it's not just words whenever the Lord speaks something sends out a word it accomplishes exactly that which God intends, whether it's speaking life into existence or healing into our lives. And every time we get to hear God's word read and proclaimed, it does something that God fully intends in us. And so part of being a family of faith, of being disciples of Christ, is every time um, we come and worship, we recommit ourselves to Jesus Christ. And we do that in a lot of different ways. We do it in prayer. We do it in uh, confession. 
We do it in the sacrament of communion, and we do that through the giving of tithes and offerings to Jesus Christ as an act of devotion, as a declaration that this is who's in charge, not just our jobs, not just our needs, financial and otherwise, but Jesus. And so for those of you who are joining us here in person, you'll see the offering plate as you take your leave tonight. And for those of you joining us at home, you can participate in what Christ is doing here at GPC through the giving tab on our website. And as I said earlier, one of the special things that we are, I'm super excited about this, we're going to celebrate communion every week starting tonight. And just to show you how good God is, we call this the table of grace. And I proved that this morning because when I was leading the prayer for communion, I forgot to say the Lord's Prayer <laughs> right at the end. And you know what? It worked out just fine. And God did what he wanted to do. And it was a beautiful thing. So I invite you to come to this table, wherever you are, wherever God has got you, this table is yours. This feast, this taste of heaven, the original soul food is yours. And it's for all people. This isn't a Presbyterian table, it's Jesus. And so he welcomes us to come. Would you join me in a brief prayer? God, thank you for the beauty of this day and bringing us here safely to encounter your holy presence in this, your place. Now, there are a lot of reasons that brought us in to worship tonight, but chiefly, we need to hear you. We need to feel you. In our journey of faith, there are times where we get depleted and our souls get dehydrated and it's really hard to find words to pray, the desire to come to church, but we would rather do something else. And yet we hear in your invitation to come to this, your table, an opportunity, an opportunity to be refreshed, to be encouraged, strengthened, energized, not by pulling ourselves up by our own religious bootstraps, but by you, showing up and doing only what you can do. So thank you, Jesus. We welcome and invite and actually beg of your spirit to come now, to hover over the surface of these normal elements of bread and juice and make them for us by your power and your grace, a feast that transforms us from the depths of our souls all the way to our relationships and our lives to become more and more the people that you've called us to be. We thank you so much, Lord. And we pray all of these for the words that you taught us to pray and saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. A little after that passage that Pastor Will read for us and preached for us. Jesus was having dinner with his best friends. And during the course of the meal, he took a piece of bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, take, eat this. This bread is my body, broken for you. Eat of it, all of you, and remember me. In a similar way, after dinner, Jesus took a cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink of it, all of you, and remember me. 
a little while after, a guy named Paul came around and he taught us that every time we get to eat this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim our Lord's saving death until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for us, the people of God. Amen. Family, this table is ready for you. So I invite you to come forward as you feel comfortable and receive a piece of bread and to dip it in the cup as you receive a blessing over your partaking of communion. Would you join me in a prayer? God, thank you. Thank you for caring about all of us. Not just all that we do and say, but for who we are as your friends who call us. And so, God, as you have nourished us, we pray that by your Spirit, you would send us forth into this night, refreshed and invigorated by your grace, by what you do, in and through us. Come, Lord Jesus, come. May your will be done. Amen. Would you stand with us if you give us last time?
serve your neighbor as yourself. And as you go, may the grace of Almighty God and may the Holy Spirit be with you. May God's power shine upon you and may you be empowered for your life in Christ's service. Amen. Amen.